Okay, thank you very much. Last lecture of the conference. I'm pleased to present Madeline Del Toro Cherney. She is an anthropology and ethnograph. Sorry, start again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I do. <laughs> Anthropology and ethnography professor at Stony Brook University. Madeline, can I call you Madeline? Sure. Thank you. Specializes in social anthropology, cultural identity, and ethnographic immigration with immigrational imagination. Sorry. It's I can just tell you. Okay, what Thank I do. You. <laughs> Let Thank me you. Tell you. <laughs> Big round of applause for Madeline. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think you got that blurb from the Stony Brook website, so I'll personalize that a little bit more so we don't have all those isms. <laughs> okay, I'm from the, the States, from New York. I have a Hispanic background, uh, Puerto Rico and Honduras. And I uh, studied anthropology in school, the, the study of humans, and I concentrated on Latin American studies because of my own personal heritage and because of my interest in, uh, in my past as well as immigration issues within New York. I went to Stony Brook University for undergrad. I did my graduate studies at New York University, and I conducted their uh, studies there with Mexican immigrants in New York City and their issues of identity. Um, what we, we talked about these issues throughout this conference as well. Um, this paper that I'm going, my current study now is in Costa Rica. Uh, I work with the Bribri indigenous community in Costa Rica. Um, I did the first study abroad program at Stony Brook University this past January, and I brought a group of 20 American undergrad students to the field site in this indigenous community that I'm going to tell you about. Um, my paper is called Culture as Commodity, a little bit of a follow-up from our lecture that we had last night when we were talking about cultural issues, and I brought up the ugly word of money <laughs> and capitalism. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all me. Okay, so, so this, what this paper explores this issue. How do you compromise living in a capitalist society and um, how do you become authentic in your culture? Okay, so the Bribri indigenous community um, has a culture, but culture, I'm using a little different, I'll define it here, um, in a sense of the identity of a group of people, old world anthropology, right, culture, what people believe in, what are their values, their belief system, um, other than just cultural arts as, as dance or performance or something like this. They do have that as well. Okay, so this uh, paper explores this creative use of the culture as a use of a commodity means, as a product. And this product they sell enhances international culture, cultural diplomacy as well as ensures their own cultural continuity within the global market. So. This is what this paper is, is showing, okay? The study is based on my personal interactions and my field work with this community and this people, and um, I've, I've been with them and the tourist activities that they do. Um, okay, so I start my paper, okay, uh, with this quote from Karl Marx. The private property of the worker in his means of production is the foundation of small-scale industry, and small-scale industry is a necessary condition for the development of social production and a free individuality of the worker himself. So I use this quote as the running theme throughout the paper that kind of ties um, the, this culture, the indigenous person, to their means of production because they are their own creative use of their culture. There is, no, there is no intermediary. They are the creators from their traditions and from their ancestral past. And they know their culture. They know who they are. This is their identity. And in these ecotourism ventures, they sort of display this within their own lands. They live on reservation lands. Um, and the land is kind of the cohesive or the time point of all of this, because as this quote uh, points out, the private uh, property of the worker in his means of production. So since they have self-ownership, since they have ownership and it's theirs, the, the profit goes straight back to them. There's no middleman. Um, so it's this kind of 
equilateral relationship. So negotiation, they negotiate their culture, yes they do, and they do it as a means for survival. Um, but the survival goes just beyond self-survival. It's economic survival, cultural survival, because they propagate their culture, and the environment. Um, the environment is actually a very essential aspect to all of this, being that it is tied in their land, and being especially the, way, the place where they are. They are in the rainforest, in the few remaining rainforests in Central America. In the paper, I argue about the word authenticity, what that really means. Because perhaps some people might see this and they'll say, whoa, you know, they're selling themselves or something like this. You know, what's authentically here? So what is authentic? You know, what does it mean to be authentic or to be real? Um, so in this, uh, what I think authenticity is, is authenticity is something that takes place in the present, in the, in the current moment, and it gives people a sense of who they are through their own understanding of their tradition and heritage, not through an anthropologist telling them about their heritage or their culture. Um, indigenous culture is passed down through oral history, mainly, instead of written history, so oral traditions change over time. They basically remain true to ancestral origins and beginnings, but they evolve over time because it's oral, because history for an indigenous community is living in the present. It's not just about the past, but it's about how the past is relived in the present. Um, indigenous time is called circular time, so it always comes around, it always comes back. In Western cultures, we are used to a mode of dates and linear time. Something happens here, then it happens, it evolves, it modernizes, it progresses. In indigenous culture, things you know, life goes on and moves on, but these stories always become real when they're told to somebody. So if you're listening to a person's history like we are today, we're living it now. So it's not just the past, but it's the present, and it just evolves in this way. So authenticity is, is the moment, is the reality, is the present. So culture is a negotiation that gives the people a sense of identity and also into, into modern life. They live in the modern globalized world like all of us do. And just because they have been perhaps exoticized, because they are, you know, um, a, a, a culture that many outsiders consider uni unique or exotic or unique. Um, different, different, I guess is the word. So it's. Um, what they, they use their sense of their history and their traditions and their past because it's a tourist draw for people to come and see this. And they use it in, as authentically as they see fit. And they also, you know, you pay them for these tours, which is actually a very um, unique relationship between people um, of this type. So an anthropologist typically when they go to study a culture, they do observatory um, observations. They, they kind of interact with the people and they just observe and talk to them. This is more uh, an exchange value thing. So you come as a tourist. So it's not an anthropological um, relationship. It's a relationship between the tourist, uh, the person giving the tour, and the commodity. And the commodity here or the product is the culture. Um, in the paper, I'm not going to do the whole thing. I think uh, Mark told me that the papers will be posted later on online, so if you want to go through the whole thing. The paper is a bit academic, so I don't want to um, get into all the authors that I quote and the bibliography. Um, I will show you examples of some of the people and some of the experiences that, um, that I've witnessed while I was there. This is Danilo Layang Gab. And he is a Bribi leader, a leader, and he is the owner of a lodge, an eco lodge, um, in Costa Rica, in the Talamanca region. And he says that his dream is that through world cultural encounters, the traditions of the Bribi will prevail, and they also enhance um, international cultural exchange because he shares the knowledge of the Indian with other people. Typically, the Indian doesn't want to share his knowledge. But in this case, the Indian wants to share his knowledge, and he wants to be a part of the greater community. The lodge is called Ditsowu. That's a D behind the leaf there. And that, in Bribri language, means meetings of cultures. So he is a cultural diplomat, to me, in the purest sense, because he welcomes people, and he opens his house, and he exchanges his culture. He's very open. And he asks questions of you just as much as you might ask questions of, of his culture. So the curiosity goes both ways. 
Uh, wireless is turned off. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. It's. Oh, okay. Is it the. Ah, okay, I have a Mac. <laughs> I'm not used to these. <laughs> All right, so when he welcomes people to his, his, his lodge, he says, um, we have many voices, many faces, many colors, but only one heart and only one God, Sibu. So if someone welcomes you in this way, I think it's a very gracious, welcoming effort. It's a diplomatic effort. One of the things that has impressed me in this conference is how gracious everyone is in their welcoming and you know, thank you very much for coming. And it's, it's a, an honor to have you here. He spends much time welcoming people and honoring people and to share this. He's the host and he wants to share his life with you. But he also mentions um, we only have one God, Sibu, right? So what? If you were there and a person introduces themselves like this, just out of curiosity, what would be your initial reaction to that? Who is Sibu? <laughs> but we only have one God, right? Okay, so yeah. Is it, uh, is it a contradiction or, you know, what is going on here, right? Welcome, welcome, please come in. Here's our house. You know, we, we're all together. We have this, we have this, but we only have one God, Sibu. <laughs> okay, okay. So, all right, so what is going on here? So essentially, he is being gracious. He's welcoming everybody. But um, what he's saying is, you are all welcome here, but you are in Bribri country. So it's an assertion of culture, and it's assertion of a person and of who they are in a very diplomatic means. We hear a lot about Cebu throughout all of this. Uh, Native Americans in all of the Americas have been very Christianized, missionized because of the missionizing effort. So there's a lot of this religious um, undertone in everything that's done. You're always thanking God. In, in this case, you're always thanking Cebu. Um, and so anyway, it, it goes on. And I'll talk a little bit about the religion because that was to me a, a very curious phenomenon that happened here. I just want to give you the geography of where we are. Um, it's Costa Rica. We're in Costa Rica. Uh, has anyone ever been there? Oh, beautiful, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hot tourist destination. Everybody goes there. It's a beautiful, uh, great place to be. Um, I, I did my field work in a safe place as opposed to some people <laughs> who go to dangerous areas, right? <laughs> okay. So it's the uh, Talamanca Reservation is on the Caribbean seaside over here, and it's surrounded by the Cord Cordillera, the mountain range of the Talamanca region. And the indigenous reservation, it's blown up. It's right here. It's all, it's very close to Panama and borders the Caribbean Sea, but it's a little inland. And they have this geographical space right here, um, which is their lands from ancestry and also now from, you know, politics. A little background on the Bribri. Anthropologists have, of course, been in this area. Um, the, the kind of premier anthropologist is Alison Skinner, and he wrote this book in the 1920s. This is what the people, the same people that um, the, the few, actually these people are, you know, just a couple grandparents removed from the people that I was with. This is their living quarters, the Casa Conica, the, the structure, the architectural structure. And there are some of the Bribri people that Alison Skinner, um, who was with, studied about, okay? This is what it looks like now. So um, it hasn't, you know, it hasn't changed that much. This population here in this community is less than 100 people, and it's still a very um, isolated life. Um, th those, those are new architectures on the side. The government has provided schools for the children there. That's kind of a tin roof and an open schoolhouse. Um, they don't have hot water. They do have electricity. Obviously, there's no cell phone service and things like this. But you're tucked kind of in the rainforest area. It's, it's really beautiful. It's um, uh, mostly a pristine kind of quiet area. Okay. Um, this I want to show you as an example of their politicking. Danilo, um, the Bribri leader, is also involved in the uh, Bureau of Indigenous Affairs in the, in the community there in Bribri. And he organized in August, this, just this past August 2011, this Gran Feria Cultural Acuc. 
um, a, a gathering of the community, gra gathering of all the indigenous people in the area. And he brought them all into this kind of pasture area. Bienvenido, Spanish, welcome, English, uh, Buari, uh, Bribri, Jujacara, uh, Chip Chip. They, there's different linguistic groups there. They're cheap, cheap bang people. And so the whole point was to get the indigenous community into this gathering field, which was kind of a celebration, a festival. We talked about festivals here. So this is a festival of indigenous culture. And they um, sold food and artifacts and things. But it was very small. It was the first effort. This is Danilo in the stage front there. And curiously, he also re, um, invited the local politicians. So the local politicians came as well. And again, it was this extreme diplomacy. Thank you so much for coming. We are so grateful. We're so welcome. You've done so much for our community. We are so grateful for you. Let me see if I can get this video going. El tribunal ha dado la libertad a todos nosotros, en este momento respiramos la vida libre gracias a ellos, gracias a las elecciones libres en Costa Rica, gracias a todos los indígenas que están inscritos en Costa Rica, gracias al tribunal en estos momentos caminamos, soñamos libremente, gracias a Dios que tenemos un tribunal con transparencia en este país y de hecho todos están inscritos, solamente nos queda el totelire para evacuarlo máximamente. Y vamos a hacer y vamos a hacer soñar a todos ellos porque todos tenemos que garantizar el libre ante las garantías sociales porque la verdad es que tenemos que acceder todas las libertades para tener el acceso al, al seguro, al, al INA, a los estudios. Entonces tenemos que inscribir a estos chicos de alta terrible, magistrado, yo les, les garantizo a usted que tienes alguien que va a luchar de ahora en adelante para que todos los sueños de alto teoría sea una realidad. Y también quiero tener aquí, es, tenemos la licenciada este... But next to Danilo on his right is um, the mayor of the town and a few of the politicians. So the first video was him doing a lot of welcoming and a lot of thanking and a lot of graciousness. I mean, that went on for a very long time, the honor and the graciousness, the language of diplomacy, His Excellency, His Honor. The second video is him making the demands of the community in a kind of a way saying how we don't have social services, we don't have health care here, uh, we really need to expand this into our community, we need the roads improved, you know, the basic services for all Costa Ricans. In Costa Rica, you need a cédula de, de identidad, your ID card, in order to uh, manage transactions for anything. You, you need this card. For the indigenous community, it's not that easy to obtain the card because a lot of them still don't speak Spanish and they do have to go to the government offices. So Danilo, in his grassroots efforts, organizes a school bus to pick them up and take them to these offices and translate as best as possible. But he's bringing the politicians to the community to show this festival um, in this very honorable way, um, to eat the foods and the music and all of this, but also to make them aware of the difficulties. So it's a kind of a strategic effort because they had to travel. It's not easy to get here. It's very difficult to get here. They had to travel to get here and to see the conditions of the people and, and what is going on. Um, so it was really an amazing effort at cultural and I would say political diplomacy. These are the Bribri attending the festival, listening to Danilo. Danilo would speak in Bribri as well as in Spanish. And here are three generations of women, of Bribri women, you know, trying to uh, feel pride in who they are, feel pride in their community. The festival is kind of a pride festival, you know, this, this cultural festival of, uh, of beginnings. Uh, it's interesting, too, that there, there's a huge family network. This is actually Danilo's brother and his son and the uncle and the aunt. And the, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a huge family network that's all connected with this. And here is the commerce. They're selling, um, they, they do these carved gourds, um, these really interesting carved gourds, and they, they paint them and they sell them, and that's in the, in the Bribri language. So the, the culture was diplomacy, cultural, political, as well as artistic, in a very you know, unique kind of venue. Um, a little bit of the history of uh, North American economic policies in the area. I'm supposing most people are familiar with the politics, so I won't get 
to it as much. But there, it, there, you could see from the slide the imperialistic policies in America. <laughs> you know, as far as economy, NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, in which the, most of the Latin American countries were kind of made banana republics because of monocropping exports. Uh, this is old news. No. <laughs> Maybe read the paper because I don't want to get into this whole history and politics. But anyway, these are demonstrations because of it. What happened with this policy was it benefited the, the United States in a way because land was cleared in Latin America for these monocrops, for bananas, for coffees, for um, uh, main productions. And then they, they were shipped at a price. They were exported at a price. But what was happening at the level in Latin America was uh, the, the people were being pushed out of the lands in order to grow these plantations. The forests were being cut in order to have these plantations grow. And there was displacement, and there was poverty, and there was malnutrition in the country that was producing all these foods for the North. So obviously, Latin America has had a very contentious history con el, con el norte, <laughs> with its northern neighbors. And the, the landscape of Latin America is changing. It's becoming very socialist and nationalistic because of these prior policies. And Costa Rica is kind of the peacekeepers, the, the boundaries between it. This is Oscar Arias, uh, a former president of Costa Rica who established a peace accord in the area when there was the Contra movement and the, the uh, I won't get into the whole drug thing. <laughs> but anyway, he did a peace accord in the area. And it wasn't looked upon that favorably in the north because he was promoting um, you know, more of a socialist, nationalist effort in the, in the Latin American countries. Argo export in the environment. Uh, so what, as a result of this, of what happened in the country, the fields and the deforestation uh, cleared a lot of the land. So in this one, I don't know if you could see, there's a little monkey on a barbed wire fence. So the animals have been displaced. There aren't that many monkeys because they need the cordillera. They need the continuity of the forest to jump from tree to tree. So if there's no tree, then you know, there's, there's no space. These are palm oil farms. And that's an example of a plantation that actually is one of the things that they export right now is palm oil. It's one of the export, the Argo crops. Uh, there's a lot of cattle ranching that goes on there, which again clears the land and they raise these cattle for what is known as the hamburger connection. Uh, the cattle are, are killed for meat to ship back to the United States. And, and those are bananas underneath there, bananas for expert. This has been a part of the landscape, so it's obviously still there. The Bribri actually grow organic bananas, which are more sustainable than, say, uh, clearing for like the United Fruit Company bananas. What's happened in Costa Rica's economy was these Argo exports were not stable. If there was a storm, a flood, or something happened, then you couldn't count on the product for sale. You couldn't export it. So the economy suffered. So they, in the 1980s, they started to come up with a new economic initiative, and it was tourism. And the big push there was for this nature-based tourism because they do have a, a large concentration of the, na uh, of the rainforest and they have a huge con uh, concentration of biodiversity. So the push was to do this nature-based tourism and it was an extremely successful model. Many other countries follow this model on how to promote your country's wealth. But the country's wealth here is nature, the rainforest and the fields. These are some of the advertising examples. So what happened with this, an onslaught of tourism came to Costa Rica for this nature experience. And it's a curious phenomenon because the tourists that it attracts are people from first world countries who want this kind of explorer's adventure. You want to you know, experience nature at its purity, at its finest. And there is a lot of nature left, but you know, there is a lot of deforestation as well. So with this grand push, the economy of Costa Rica boosted up. Mainstream tourism did actually very well. So the indigenous community in the area, the people that I'm telling you about, said, well, you know, the country's doing so well. What, what if we do this? We can do this. Why can't we do this? So in 2000, Danilo built this house. This is Dizzo Wu. I don't know if you could see it. It's a huge natural structure. He just used all the um, trees from the area. Didn't really, it's tucked right in the forest. So like 
there's no windows or anything. But so everything is very sustainable, very green. It's pure green ecotourism, really, in its most natural state. They cook. This is the kitchen. It's all one big area. It's like a treehouse. So this is the kitchen, and that's a fogong. So they cook the old-fashioned way with an open fire. And he was able to employ some of the Bree Bree community in this venture. It's a hotel. And the tourists come. But it's only a specific type of tourist that comes to this. It's um, a, a tourist that's interested in um, ecology, conservation efforts. Students typically come. Academics come who are studying the environment and the effects of environment on the community. These are some of what I call the entrepreneurs. They have a whole list of different tours that they do. So that's Danilo waving in his boat. Uh, he's very gracious. Uh, this is Ito. I'll talk to you about him a little bit. He does a rainforest tour. They're all in their lands. So, you know, it's, it's the backyard. It's, they have their homes and it's the backyard because it's the rainforest, because it's where they live, that they just kind of take you and then you go into the house and they give you a little lemonade and that's el refresco, the refreshment. And it's very inexpensive. So it's not for your mainstream tourists, obviously, because it's a rugged place. Uh, this is Justo. He is in the Casa Conica, and he does the storytelling, what I was telling you, the oral storytelling history, and they do a bonfire, and they kind of recreate the past atmosphere, and they tell you the myths, the myths of the Bree Bree, how, the origin stories, the creation stories, how things came to be. Um, here is... Um, um, Juanito, I think, up there. He's actually in a government-provided houses. The government does provide these homes for them, um, modern homes with plumbing and stuff. And he gives the coffee tour because he has a coffee plantation. Um, it's also Panama. The connection goes into Panama. So this tour here takes you across the, the river into Panama, and you go to a waterfall. It's all indigenous property as well. And you swim in the waterfall, and they take you back. This is Petronila. She's the only female that I encountered, and I'll talk to you about her later. I found her to be one of the most enterprising uh, people. So the um, essence here is that they, they try to negotiate the sustainability of their economy. They don't charge a lot. They're not like corporations, right? It's, it's, a, it's a very simple relationship. It's the, pro, it's the person, the, the, the laborer, the commodity, which is the culture, and the consumer. So it's a, it's a straight relationship. There's no corporation. So it's about e sustainability in economy, sustainability of culture, keeping their culture alive. Otherwise, it would not be alive if you don't share it, if you don't live it, if you don't give it. And it's keeping the land as, as pristine and as healthy as it could be, because it's not knocking it down for a huge hotel. It's putting this very simplistic kind of structure into it. This is the rainforest tour, which actually is, is one of my favorite. I'll read you this little section in the paper about this, this tour here. One of the most memorable Bree Bree eco tours is the frog and butterfly hike in a densely rainforest area. As the hike proceeds into the forest, the immense foliage overwhelms the atmosphere and the natural world closes in, gradually filling your senses with unfamiliar sounds, fragrant smells, green vastness, and the damp moisture of the surroundings. Inevitably, you become immersed within the land, feeling a sensory connection to the soil, air, and leaves. The Bree Bree guide, Ito, takes the group deeper into the forest and points out details, which would otherwise go unnoticed. He states, an Indian knows the forest, and therefore the forest will always protect him, feed him when he is hungry, cure him when he is sick, and satisfy him when he is thirsty. Ito cuts a tree limb with his machete and lets the water flow from its pores to show the benevolence of the forest. As the walk progresses, Ito mentions how this area is a reforested area that has reestablished itself since the drought of the 1980s. The drought washed away the banana plantation owned by the United Fruit Company that was once this forest. The small ferns growing on the forest floor and the return of the frogs and the butterflies are nature's evidence of a healthy environment. Since the drought, the United Fruit Company vacated the area that was once Ito's land, and now he can safely return to his ancestral lands. 
The United Fruit Company neglected the area because of its unproductiveness and the economic losses they suffered. So you could see a juxtaposition. For the corporation, for the United Fruit Company, this was considered lost land, unproductive. There was a drought, so nature washed away the crops, so they couldn't sell their product anymore. And so the family, oh, OK, it's no good anymore, so <laughs> now you can go back. So they went back. And for them, the productivity of the land is the growth, is the nature. And that is their product, living in harmony with what was there all along. Ito states that his business is doing very well and that he enjoys teaching others the ways of the trees. Ito is not a forest ranger, nor does he hold a degree in ecology or sustainability. His father and grandfather have passed down their knowledge, and in order for the knowledge to live on, he passes it on to those, he tells me this, those who know how to listen. So depending on the connection that he feels with the community, as you go through this walk, he, he gives you the medicines, the medicines of the forest, how the Indian lives. Um, he pointed that out about the water, like if you're thirsty. Oh, there's no problem if you're thirsty. You don't need a water bottle. You know, you do this, you know. It's this kind of uh, nature-based tourism. Um, the image of the Indian, I, I talk about it a little bit from an anthropological perspective as well, and also from a Latin American perspective. Uh, Spanish communities have had since colonization the casta system, kind of a hierarchy of race. Um, the color line, you know, the black slaves and, and the Indians and the whites. Um, they have typically been segregated from the community because of being Indian and, you know, <laughs> not fitting into the hierarchy. Curious thing about this group of people is their geography that I showed you in the map. They are on the border of the Caribbean Sea, and it's encircled by a group of mountains, the Cordillera Talamanca. So it was very inaccessible for the conquistadores when they first came, because there wasn't gold. There wasn't like a lot there that they could usurp and take away. So it was kind of an ignored area. So what had happened, the inhabitants of the area were, were uh, People fleeing. It was the, the slaves that were fleeing the conquistadors. It was pirate people. It was a lot of uh, Afro-Caribbeans. And it was kind of a safe haven because of the mountain range. The mountain range is so high that it was inaccessible. So they were kept kind of segregated, luckily, <laughs> and isolated from this whole other uh, white Spanish mainstream that was going on. So this is why in 1920, they are still living a very kind of, I don't like to use the word primitive, but a very nature life. You know, they, they still use blood blow guns to hunt their animals and to eat them. And they were still, there was still a chief hierarchy. There was still very much uh, the old ways. Um, the, the Allison Skinner, the anthropologist, points out that they use dugout canoes to cross the river. Well, here we are in two times. Uh, 2012, and he is using a dugout canoe to cross the river, and that is how you cross the river. You go there, and um, you know they take you across that way. Here is the Bribri family, um, the you know carrying the baby and the children, and you know the contemporary Bribri family. They, they still they, they have some equal rights for women, but you know not too much. <laughs> you know it's still kind of a little bit that way. But anyway, that's the dad with the son in um, in one of the communities, a small community. They still pretty much live a kind of a simple life. The land. So the land here is the, the unifying effort. The fact that this land remained isolated and that they could stay there helped them keep their culture alive even more. So their culture kind of sobrevivir, you say in Spanish, survived, survived throughout the ages. And um, because of the, the Afro-Caribbean community in there, it's more like a, a site of cultural resistance. So the language spoken actually in Puerto Viejo is, is English more than Spanish because of the inf influence of coming in there. All right. So again, this is a picture of them doing their cultural diplomacy during what they do. This is Danilo taking a boat tour of tourists. Um, actually, he's from the Netherlands. A lot of Europeans go there. A lot of uh, European students go there as well. And he's taking them across the river and showing them the sites. And here on the other side is the coffee plantation. And they're showing how to grind coffee. Uh, it's totally sustainable living. And, and you get a little cup of coffee to taste. And then they take you to the fish hatchery because they're doing a little fish hatchery. So they're doing all these ventures. And it's pure labor, total labor. They, they do it all themselves. 
and they profit from it. This is the, the religious aspect that I wanted to talk to you. This is a Biraka Kakepa, which is also a shaman. He is a shaman. And he is a very unique person. He's young for a shaman. The shaman is the indigenous leader as well as the medical healer. Uh, the community it does not have a lot of access to public health care, so they refer to the shaman for their help. And he provides the medicines, the medicines from the forest for, for ailments and things. And here the Viraka is having a group of tourists coming around, and he's speaking to them and, and telling him about his culture. I'll just give you a little quote on that, too. A strong religious syncretism pervades the talk of Cebu, the eternal god of us all, the god of the vampire bat who resides in the house of Cebu, the god of the tapir daughter who was stomped on the ground, the god of the crushed bones of the girl, and the god of the white people who have come to listen to the teachings of Cebu. Cebu the Almighty who allows us all to eat corn. Cebu the Almighty who allows us all to drink chocolate. Not just the Indian, but the yellow man, the black man, the white man. All the men eat corn. All the men drink chocolate and thank Cebu for all his blessings. You must thank Cebu for all the world that he alone has created. The talk shifts to mythology again, but again it reverts to Cebu's blessings. At times, the Bikakra shifts his focus and begins to talk of dream visions and of the sacred things that are revealed in dreams. He talks of the souls of men, the footprints on the earth, the life of the trees, the life of the air we breathe, the life of the rainforest, all because of Cebu. The talk is circuitous, but follows a pattern. Inclusiveness, exclusiveness, universalisms, uniqueness, the world, the bribri. So in this cultural exchange, he's sharing, but not really. He's sharing some knowledge. He's giving you this sort of generalities. And you can kind of hear the Christianity and the missionizing, the Almighty, the God. But there's always the Cebu, and there's always the vampire. So there's always the sense of cultural uniqueness, cultural mythology, and, and a sense of self of who they are. But he doesn't share everything, as I said, um, including his name. The Bikakura is just a title, but it's not like a personal um, person. These are some museum objects by Skinner from the 20 um, that actually are still done there. Uh, chicha jar is where you keep chicha, which is indigenous beer. Headdress they don't wear, but it is there. Some of these objects were considered sacred, and in the paper I speak about how in the past these sacred items still had to be purchased, but purchased through respect of the Bikakura's blessings. So the ties to religion goes to the objects as well. It's not just religious talk, but there are religious objects. Indigenous knowledge, um, while they show you how they manage their lives. This is a raft. They tie the raft together from trees. Um, they actually untie it every time they cross the river, let the logs flow down the river, and every time you need another raft, um, you just put it together. High intensive labor, it's, there's a lot of labor going on. That's a display table of a lot of the medicines from the forest, a lot of the plant medicines. If you're curious, I can tell you about them, but I know we're pressed for time, so I won't go through, through each one and what, what its use is for. This is Petronila. I mentioned her to you. I thought she was extremely curious. Uh, she was the only female that I did meet. And she decided to do this because she was a single uh, woman. Her, her husband had left her, and she had these children, and she had to figure out how to survive. So she had this small house, and in, the, in her backyard she has cacao trees, chocolate trees. And so she decided, well, there's all these tourists coming around here. Uh, I'm going to see if I could market this and show them how I make my chocolate. She's always made her chocolate. It's just part of her traditions. Food. Food is a, a great, <laughs> you know, people catcher. So what she did is she opens up her home. This is her home. And she goes through the bri, -bri process on how to manufacture chocolate. She heats it up and does it. And she, she shows you. And then she sells you. She sells you the little bit of chocolate pieces. And she does this. It's, it's, it's like $5, American dollars, to do this. And she, show, she gives you the tour. She gives you the little talk. And I, I, I always... And she told me because of this, she was able to survive. She is the main, um, the main breadwinner for her family. She's put her children through school because of her little business. So for her, this is really great. And, and you know, when you think of the dichotomy of modernity and antiquity or modernity and authenticity, 
Uh, I said, well, you know, you know, when she talks about her culture, too, she talks about traditions, but she really puts them into the modern sense. Um, typically, when women had their babies, they were put in the, you know, in the separate area, but no, I chose to, you know, go to the hospital. That was more safe. And so she says she considers herself a very modern woman because in the past, women could not own businesses or do these things on their own. So for her, it's a sense of empowerment to be able to do this completely on her own. But she's, she still feels she's extremely authentic to her culture. She is still sharing the knowledge that she knows. And for her, there's no discrepancy in this kind of thing. OK. Uh, the topic of modernity, um, you know, coping with modern life, with modern technology, and surviving, surviving your life as best you can, and the environment. The land, I think, is, is fortunate for them. And it was curious to me in the eco little story that I read to you that it was a natural disaster that enabled the community to come back to their land. OK, you want me to? <laughs> OK, so the paper is a little longer. I'm a little pressed for time, so I won't uh, go into it. But the point is that the laborer is totally connected to their source of income because of what they do, and the ecological efforts, the environmental efforts, which, which there's a whole part there about what radical ecology means, what that means, as opposed to sustainable. And I go into this, but I won't have time to explain it. This is Marxist. This is kind of living labor, what that means when a laborer works for a corporation, as opposed to when a laborer works for his, for his own needs, when he has his private property, as opposed to having that uh, corporate other. Uh, labor, commodity, consumer, again, this is Marxist terminology, this is capitalism, and how this form of pre-capitalism is, is kind of going on in uh, the Bribri community. Conclusions, I'll read my conclusion paragraph, and I know we have to run, <laughs> catch a subway. Okay, in conclusion, this essay proposes that cultural authenticity is a harmonizing balance between dichotomous forces that are mutually contradictory as well as mutually complementary. The Bribri modernist ethos of using their cultural traditions as a means of economic commodity is a poignant assertion of human dignity. Against all odds, this small community of indigenous laborers work with the world system in order to maintain and secure the future of their cultural existence. They are cultural diplomats in the most authentic sense since they believe in an egalitarian ethics of a universalist human connection. It is impossible to return to a time that was since we live in a time that is. Therefore, authenticity is a product of the current, current moment. In a globalized postmodern world, we must confront the challenges that lie ahead and consider humanist ethics within the scope of a mode of social production. And I know, that's it. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for that.